um, in common that we share that we're going to discuss today. I really come to this conversation in a very casual way, as I shared with Rabbi a few minutes ago, I delivered two lectures today, spoke for four hours in a much more structured way. And I'm here to share a little bit about my background. Um, and that is that I was born hated as a Bosnian Muslim, as Bosniak in former Yugoslavia in the Balkans. And um, grew up uh, never hearing a story about a Muslim girl in uh, a positive light. Um, I was a, a math and physics geek. It was ultimately a winning of math and physics competitions at the national level that brought me to the United States on a scholarship after I had survived Bosnian genocide. But I grew up being invisible in my educational system in my, um, in my country growing up. But what I did not expect was that I would, by the time I was 16, be escaping concentration camps and rape camps in Bosnia. Um, for those of you who might not be familiar with the history of that region, in early 1990s, uh, Serbia invaded Bosnia and Herzegovina, my country, after former Yugoslavia fell apart. Serbia had an intention to build greater Serbia. Uh, based on this idea of ethnic, racial, religious purity that required eradication of Bosnian Muslims. And so I grew up um, never expecting, as Sam and I discussed a couple of day days ago, really up to the last days of peace, I never expected that I would end up living under a military siege by the Serb army for 1,150 days without normal schooling, constantly bombed, without access to food. And during those nearly four years, I lost many members of my family for one reason only, because who we were. And we can go into details of that story and what I had survived. We'll do some reading this evening. Uh, but I also want to highlight that I was saved by a Jewish philanthropist, a Jewish man who decided that he would um, save one life uh, from Bosnia. And the reason for that was that Bosnian Muslims throughout history, including that war in the 1990s, saved a Sarajevo Haggadah, uh, which you can Google. It is an invaluable book. And Muslims through history have preserved it from destruction. And my host father, as I called him, David Pincus, he has passed on since then, decided um, he would find a person that he would save. And I was that person. I came to the United States with his help. I spoke no English. Um, at the time, I was self-taught when it comes to English. Uh, started learning it during the war. Um, and um, um, he really enabled um, an entirely different life for me um, that I am still deeply grateful for. He and his family are really my family um, in, in many ways. And so I just want to share that intimate personal uh, uh, element of my story as we start tonight. And I also would like to say that I welcome any questions this evening. I know Rabbi Ezra is going to, to moderate questions, but I would really love to engage in a very organic a conversation about these difficult experiences that highlight hatred in our lives. And even today, we've seen um, attack against American, um, uh, Asian Americans that is, again, a reflection of deep-seated hatred that is on the rise throughout the world. Um, and with that, um, I will hand it over to, to my dear friend, Sam. Thank you. Thank you very much. I um, I came here because I decided that suffering must have an answer, and then one must look for solutions so that they never repeat again. And for that reason, since I started talking to schools. And I saw that the students were much more interested in, 
in the happenings of humanity. Um, in some schools, nothing is being taught about history or very little to the extent that they, they actually know nothing. Um, so I, when I saw that, when I saw the response from them, I decided that one should reach young people because they are the future. And even the, those that are brainwashed, those people who are brainwashed by one's children, and if they had at one time in their life, someone or some people who would look after their emotional development, emotional and mental development, this world would be a better world. Unfortunately, indifference is as common as, as evil. And uh, unfortunately, the, I found a lot of indifference in this world. Uh, I, did not, I did not expect, frankly, that I would ever get out of that horrible life which we lived in concentration camp. And my father had, was a very uh, optimistic man and hoped always that humanity will wake up and will not allow these insane things to happen. But although he was, he was an optimist all his life, unfortunately he he failed in realizing how much evil there is in the world. And, uh, and I made it my purpose in life to see to it that I do everything I can to reach everyone I can because uh, the world cannot be changed in groups. Uh, unfortunately, um, uh, uh, the, uh, there is group hate, but there is no group love. Love can come from individual experiences and from the individual effort. So this is my purpose now. And for that reason, I'm so happy to be here and share it with you. And uh, I hope that we will have other chances to do that. I, um, I will just say, Sam, that when we spoke first time, one of the um, first um, comments that you had made is that we shared the, uh, we shared um, the same kind of values within our families. Um, I similarly had a father who was throughout the entire war reminding me that I should never forget my humanity. Um, I think it's a natural feeling when one is hurt and I was losing on, on good days, a friend of a friend and on bad days, members of my family who were being blown up, some raped, injured, my house was uh, bombed, my mom became deaf, we were all injured. Um, and as a young person, an organic reaction is to say, I will hate in response. I am so viscerally hated, I've done nothing to anyone and that will be my response. But what I very quickly learned, and these are emotions I explore in my story, the, the cat I never named, uh, the book that was recently published, what I quickly learned is that hatred is not only destructive, but it is self-destructive and it can never be a response. And there was one moment that I will share uh, when we were, um, we were expecting that the army that was killing us was going to come in and execute us. And my father, who was an intellectual, he loved poetry, he recited poetry, he was World War II uh, orphan. His father was killed um, fighting Nazis. We never found, he never found his grave. Um, 
And he gave all of his love that he had to us, to, to me and my two brothers. My older brother died at 15, uh, but my younger brother, Dino, is still alive. And there was this one moment when we were looking at the uh, Serb military burning the villages as they were uh, coming close uh, to our neighborhood um, and entering our city. And my father turned to me, I was 16 years old at the time. And he said, Amra, we may all be killed and you may be raped and you may be killed as well. But if you survive, there's one thing that no one can ever take away from you. And that is your education. And that was a turning point for me in the war. And that is a turning point that defined who I was then and who I am today and why I do what I do. And I think it links to what Sam just shared that when those of us who have gone through something so extreme in terms of hatred and violence in each one of our experiences may be different. Um, uh, we, we begin to examine who it is that we want to be. And for me, being an educator today, um, being a person who talks about these difficult topics that are not easy to, to speak of um, is not only the work that I do, uh, but it is a purpose um, that I have in life as a survivor. And I am always encouraged when I find others like Sam who share the same drive. And I do uh, believe that through storytelling and sharing these experiences, we can dissuade people from ever engaging in violence. Um, I'll just share that earlier today, I was teaching one of my courses where we're working on a, developing a curriculum to build resilience to hate for educators in the United States. And we will be doing that through storytelling. I am doing that together with my students. And we had a survivor of a Boston Marathon terrorist attack who came um, to speak with us, who will be working with us on that curriculum and who has started an organization where survivors of um, violence connect and tell their stories in hope to prevent violence and build resilience to hate. And so I, I have to say that for me, anytime I meet someone like Sam, like you, Sam, it feels I met a family member, someone who has the same purpose in life. Um, and, I'm, and I'm always grateful for that. I realize somehow that we have other things in common that we discussed in our private talk. And uh, for some reason, I found that, that I was not able to hate the Nazis. I was afraid of them but I couldn't hate them. I could not explain it up to this day. Perhaps it was the way my father taught me. It was the kind of approach to life that my father had. And as a matter of fact, when I told this to some students, they, uh, one of them wrote me a letter. How can you, uh, yeah, if you can, if you don't hate Nazis, what right do I have to hate anyone? And then I realized that I'm on the right track. Uh, because uh, hate is obviously, as you mentioned, Amra, is uh, self-destructive. It doesn't produce anything. And as long as people rather as soon as people learn that hate is not something that one should live with. Um, if, they be, if they begin to believe that and see it working, things will change. As a matter of fact, I had a teacher, a violent teacher, that taught me in Germany, my first violent teacher after the war, 
and uh, I happened to be in a in a uh, DP camp, displaced persons camp, after the war in uh, near Munich. And so it's a long story. I won't get into it, but I was tricked in by a friend of mine to go and meet him. Uh, I meet him. I met him, and the. Uh, to make the story shorter, is that I discovered he was a great anti-Semite. Not only was he an anti-Semite, but he was a Polish man who came to Germany during the Nazis. That will give you an idea uh, what he must have trying to prove uh, to the Nazis. I always had that suspicion, but I never paid, it, paid attention to it. The short end of it is that I brought him up to the States. He was in our house. And he stayed for a few weeks in our house until he was able to settle. He never became the same. He completely changed. Obviously, later he had a he had some some very bad ending uh, because he went out of his mind. But I, as a teenager, already felt that if a human being can reach, one can do a lot. Storytelling, um, Sam, I think is the most powerful channel for us to reach people. Um, I, I started teaching first time uh, when I was um, under the siege during the war. We didn't have normal schooling. And in fact, to, tonight I'm going to read a, a segment from my book, um, a scene that happens um, at the moment when I find out that we will have school again. And um, in, in part, the school was not possible because the targeting of uh, buildings where children would congregate was one of the priority um, targets um, during the war. Um, and many teachers were injured, killed, uh, my mother um, is a teacher, history and geography teacher. And I was asked to teach um, as a high schooler because I was this nerdy kid and there was lack of teachers. And the first time I walked into a classroom was ironically to teach English. I was teaching myself English by memorizing words from an old dictionary that my father had, I found in an attic of our house. And I thought it was a crazy idea to ask someone who barely knows anything of this language to be a teacher, but there was no one better or there was no one who, who had a greater knowledge at the time. And I walked into a classroom with fifth graders and they were so excited to dream with me through stories to depart from the world of hatred that we were living in. And we talked about ice creams. We talked about all these things that were so mundane, but for us, unachievable at the time. And that was the moment when I first time realized that connecting through education and connecting through stories is incredibly powerful. And you shared your encounter and the experience of how you impacted one person. And there was a moment when I was a graduate student um, at Columbia University doing my master's degree. And I was asked to participate in uh, evaluation of a project that was helping reintegration of soldiers in Bosnia that was ran by the International Organization for Migration at the time. And my professors at Columbia came to me knowing that obviously I speak the language, I have Bosnian background but the project required that I go to parts of the country that were ethnically cleansed, where Bosnian Muslims were eradicated um, and to engage with soldiers who were potentially the soldiers that killed members of my family, that bombed my house. 
And I remember being honest with my teachers at the time, professors, and saying that I'm willing to try, but I don't know what my reaction will be. Uh, meeting people who might have been killers of my family. And I decided to do the project. And in the process, I was changed. Um, I found that I found a form of empowerment and reminder of my own humanity and actually trying to help these soldiers. And there was one soldier, there was a moment where one Serb soldier, he was trying to get the cow. So IOM was helping soldiers, some who were um, had potential to go into higher education, were being helped to start college degrees, some were helped to start a business. And this particular soldier was hoping to get the cow so that he could um, start uh, um, his own life after the war. And the purpose of that project was to reintegrate soldiers so that they're less likely to engage in violence. And I made every effort to make sure that this Serb soldier gets his cow. And he, of course, knew based on my name, based on my Bosnian uh, as a native language, who I was, that I was Muslim. And I was transparent about that. And there was a moment when after he got his cow, he called me in tears, couldn't stop sobbing and asked me, why did you do it? Why did you help me? And I said, I helped you because I'm not you. And I want to make a point that I don't want to reciprocate with the same hatred. And I feel empowered that I can help you. And um, this man couldn't stop crying and told me that he didn't have one peaceful night um, of sleeping for things that he's done during the war and um, was changed by that moment. And I think that speaks to the power of us trying to inspire not only our own humanity after going through those kinds of extreme experiences of violence, but also inspire that kind of humanity in other people who might be tempted to hate. Um, so I uh, thank you for sharing that story um, because it's another commonality truly that, that, we, uh, that we share. Thank you. I have a similar experience. I had a similar experience in reverse. Um, I, most of the people uh, in our community know about uh, uh, the, the, the uh, witness theater is. So this is a program in which Holocaust survivors are invited and they talk about their experiences and then students write them down and then they react them on stage. That was of course before COVID. So I was on one of those invited to one of those witness theater uh, meetings. Not one, we had quite a few that was before COVID. And in comes a girl, young girl, she looked awful. Uh, she looked so emaciated as if she would have come out of a concentration camp. And I saw something is wrong, something is wrong with her. And I was wondering why did she come? It turned out that somebody in her family was a Nazi and she could not live with it. She could not talk, she could not communicate. Her mother, who's by the way, a very fine person. Uh, she happens to be a minister and uh, she was in uh, Manhattan, now she's uh, living in Berlin. Uh, she's teaching now policemen on how to behave. And uh, when I found out about the story and she started reading my story, she broke out crying and crying and couldn't stop. And so I tried to find out what is going on. As soon as I found out what it was, I decided that I would help her. Because just the fact that her mother sent her to witness theater and that she was willing as a 17 year old 
to go and find out about these things. That made her an unusual person to me. And she is certainly worth trying to be saved from a lifetime of suffering. And so I, I pursued it. By now, she calls me every week. She smiles, jokes with me. Um, I mean, she's a completely different person. And uh, it looks like things happen on the reverse too. It's, it's some, sometimes families of Nazis who feel very bad about what happened with their families. And although they are not responsible for their grandfathers or grandmothers, they feel the responsibility and they feel the guilt that many of them will be living with for all their lives. And um, another little story that I also, I could not believe when it happened. My father had a German friend uh, and uh, in, in Romania or in the other countries too, anti-Semitism was at its high. And when we were sent to the ghetto, we were going to be there only for a few days and then they were going to take us to the train to send us to concentration camp. This friend of ours, Herr Schwarz, I used to call him in German, Herr, Mr. Came up to our apartment and told my father, come and pack whatever you can. You are going to be taken to the train. I will try to hide you for as long as I can. And my father's answer was, they were close friends, by the way, very close. My father answered and said, no, thank you very much. If every, everyone goes, I must go too. I don't want to be an exception. Uh, obviously, he made a mistake because the next trans transport did not leave anymore because luckily there was a, a, um, a mayor in our city who was friendly and he tried to um, make a deal with the Germans that there's, there's a certain amount of people that he needs there to work, otherwise the city is not going to function. And so he saved a whole transport of people. If we would have stayed there, uh, there were not many, too many people left after the killing and all that. My father would have been alive. And I met him after the war and he didn't recognize me, but I recognized him and wanted to know immediately how my father was. And I told him what happened. And he cried. And that's the last time I saw him. And up to this day, I feel guilty that I was not able to help him get out of there. Although at that time it was impossible to get out of Stalin's Russia. But to help him with something and later perhaps get him out. But I was not able to be in touch with him. I don't know what happened to him. And I, up to this day, I keep thinking, if there was anything I, I could have done, I, I would have done it if, if I knew what I could do. So, so I, saw, I saw goodness and I saw bestiality. It's always a mixture of the extremes. And uh, someone reached out to me yesterday after reading the um, book and um, commented on, on the emotions in the book, um, happiness and horror, family and love and hate and family and destruction and separation. Um, and it is hard for, for those who haven't survived it to comprehend that that is possible to see the best and the worst in humans in those moments. 
For me, um, the hardest moment during the war was a moment where we had no longer food and we were under the siege. It was de facto a version of our own concentration camp. We couldn't leave, we couldn't contact the outside world. Um, we were bombed every day. And there was only one way to get food and that was either to buy it in the black market or to cross the enemy lines, risk lives and see if we can get the food. And there was a moment where my mother at that time, she was already deaf from the bomb that hit our house. She wanted to go um, into the Serb territory to try to find food. And I couldn't let her go by herself um, because I knew that she wouldn't hear a bomb, she wouldn't hear a shot. And I joined with her knowing that I was as a 16, 17 year old, putting myself at risk of being raped. And we crossed the enemy lines, we walked through minefields and tried to buy food with the little money that we had from Serb soldiers who were, um, who were there to really execute us. And we were at their full mercy. And I described that scene in the book uh, where my mother and I managed to escape um, only because the Serb soldier who tried to attack me um, was drunk. And that was, that was what saved me. But the moment of returning home empty handed and realizing how miserable we were and how much world didn't care that that was happening to us was the hardest moment um, in the war. And so any expression of humanity that we encountered during that time, during the war, for me was what was keeping me alive. And I'll bring, bring uh, a little detail that I know we also have in common, Sam, and that is that a cat that was a stray cat that um, in fact was a refugee cat because she, she came with refugees into my hometown just before the siege started and adopted herself into my family was the biggest reflection of humanity for me at the time was one living being that loved me and my family unconditionally. Um, and I do have to say that if it were not for her love in that world of hatred and killing, I'm not sure that we would have managed um, not only physically, but mentally to survive both me and my younger brother. Um, and I also would like to reflect on, on, on the reactions that you talked about early on in your reflection about the young girl who felt guilty um, about her family. I, I wrote my story decades after the experience of genocide because it is hard to talk about these issues. And I knew that I would make myself vulnerable um, to further hurt by talking about it because the hatred is still here. Neo-Nazism, as, uh, as we all know, is here. Anti-Semitism, uh, Islamophobia, anti-Muslim racism, all kinds of hatred are live and well, unfortunately. Uh, but what I didn't think about and what I didn't expect uh, was reaction from second or third generation even young Serb individuals who live in Serbia and Belgrade, whose parents may have been involved um, in one way or another, um, who have reached out to me and who have thanked me for writing the story. And that validation um, for me of everything else that has been 
written, done, studied about the genocide in Bosnia has been in a way most important because it gives me hope, as you said, that we can never look at people collectively. It is about individual goodness and individual decisions that people make, uh, whether they're Serb, Germans, Muslim, Jewish, uh, whatever their background, we all have choices to make who we want to be in a particular moment in history. I noticed that uh, we have additional similarities, even about our particular stage during the war. Uh, we were in a similar position. We were in a very small concentration camp, which the name of it disappeared from the map. The next city is mentioned on the map only. And uh, we were not given any food at all, not even bad food. And we finally had to learn how to get out at night, of course, without being caught. Uh, we Luckily, we did not have wires around us. Um, and uh, go out into the villages and um, into the fields and collect some food that the peasants did not want to bother to pick up. This is how we survived three and a half years. And the interesting part is that although I know from my own experience of the infamous name that is given to some Ukrainians in cooperating with the, with the Nazis, if not for some Ukrainian peasants, we would not have been alive. Of course, others could have, we were in great danger because their neighbors could report them and could report us and then we would have never gotten back. But luckily, we, most of us survived. Only, uh, only a small number of people were taken to work and never came back. So we also had to go out for our food. And, uh, and sometimes we, uh, we worked even for the peasants. And uh, the only time we could leave the camp when, uh, is when there was no moon. And uh, the walking was very tough because uh, in the winter we had to walk barefoot. We had no shoes left. So uh, in any case, most of the people died out anyway the first year. They could not take it, and my father among them. I think he died of typhus and frost and hunger. These three things were prevalent, and they, they really brought most people to their, to their end because it was inhuman, the, the, the situation in the camp was inhuman. And, uh, and still, we had to live with hope each day and hope that the next day we will be able to go and get some food. And uh, actually I say that we survived more through hope than through food. Thank you both. Um, I just want to first name and offer my appreciation for getting to be a fly on the wall with 60 other people as the two of you communicate and share with one another. It's really such a gift and privilege. I wanted to, um, I have a one final question, but before, and you know, we could talk for as long as you want, but uh, before I ask, I would love to hear, both of you have not only been storytellers uh, through speech. Both of, both of you are writers as well. Uh, and I would, I wanna invite each of you to read a selection, uh, Amra in your case, or uh, some poetry, Sam in your case. And if you wanna frame it or talk about how uh, the significance of these, of these selections, that would be really appreciated. 
So Amra? Sure. So I'm going to read a um, moment when I find out that the school is starting um, and I wanted to cross the main bridge in my hometown to go and tell one of my best friends that the school is starting. I was very excited, but I knew that my parents wouldn't allow me to go. And so I don't tell my parents decide to leave the house and then something terrible happens on the bridge. And so this is that scene uh, from the bridge. Then I hear a whistling overhead, a thin, reedy sound. An instant later, I see a flash as a missile hits a house on the bank of the Una, on my home side of the bridge. The sound of the explosion comes an instant later, and I stand frozen, bizarrely thinking about physics, about the relative speed of light and sound that cleaves the experience in two. First, the sight of fire and flames then disconnected by a second or two sound waves that roll over me like messengers eager to bear bad news. I hear another missile overhead launched from the mountains surrounding our town. Someone told Tata, who told me in turn, the bomb that you hear is not the one with your name on it. If you hear it whistle, it is because it's flying over your head to somewhere else. You never hear a whisper from the bomb that kills you. The air raid siren starts its high pitched howl then. We have no radar, nothing to tell us that the missiles are inbound. So the siren is a joke. It just serves to remind us that people are being killed. It gives no warning, just wails and mourns with the rest of us. Davor and I find each other again. We're still frozen in place, not knowing if we're about to die, but our eyes meet across the bridge between us. I see the mother and her little boy, the girl in the green sweater, a trio of middle-aged women who look like sisters. That would take a step towards me. Then the air seems to be sucked out of the world as I'm hit with an earth-shattering, deafening explosion. There's a flash between David and me and I'm blinded. Metal and stone are flying around me. I turn to run and it's only when my legs are moving that I realize I am not dead. I only make it a few steps before I fall, scraping my knees. In the dust and chaos, I hear screams and I drag myself to my feet, stunned. My ears are ringing and the air is choked with dust. I smell smoke. I taste smoke. There is grit on my tongue. The blue bridge is still standing. The bomb struck a glancing blow that didn't do anything much to the structure, but the pedestrians on the bridge. Against every survival instinct, I make myself walk back toward the other end of the bridge. I look all around, but don't see Davor. The little boy, the one who wanted to look at fish over the side of the bridge is standing in the middle of a cloud of masonry dust. His mouth is open. And at first I think the sound he's making is part of the loud ringing in my ears because everything sounds weirdly muffled at first. The sounds are returning to my ears one at a time. Then I realize he's screaming, a long drawn out terrible cry that stops only when he's out of breath, then starts again after a ragged gasp. I go to him. He's blonde, tussle haired and blue eyed, just like Dino when he was younger. But his little face looks impossibly old. I wish he could be confused. I wish he didn't know exactly what just happened. But this little boy understands his loss and he's suffused with helpless, inarticulate rage. I go to him, reaching out my hand. He just stares at me with his prematurely aged face. I look beyond him, blood on a stylish suit, the fox fur collar made from a whole fox, its sharp white teeth grinning as it grasps its own tail. Its black glass eyes are staring at me. Above that, nothing. There's nothing where his mother's head should be. He finds words now and his scream turns into a desperate wail for his mother. He's not looking at her, but he must have seen 
he's calling to her like his words could turn back time, undo the bomb. Like if he begs the universe loudly enough, he can make his mother alive again. I take his little hand and he looks at me like I'm an alien thing. I try to lead him off the bridge, but he's like a boulder, immovable. All this time, he never stops screaming his feral fury against the world. An old man staggers beside us. A couple clings to each other as they walk through the smoke. Though it's midday, the smoke and dust make it look like a foggy evening. Survivors are like ghosts in the haze. I still don't see Davor, not among the bodies or the survivors. The little boy's grief shatters me. There is nothing I can do. So I leave him. It's a wrenching decision, but someone will come to help him. I look at the other people on the bridge. The three middle-aged sisters are strewn about like old clothes. That is what I see. They're old lady sweaters and their sensible shoes. A man is hanging half of the bridge draped over the rail. Blood is dripping in a puddle at his feet. Then I see the girl in the green sweater like mine. She's on the ground, curled on her side, facing away from me. Her sweater is perfectly clean and tidy, like she just decided to take a nap in this odd place. I think she's unconscious. Maybe she was knocked out by the shockwave. I kneel at her side and take her shoulder, gently turning her over as I say, don't worry, I'm here. I'll help you. I roll her and find the bloody horror the front of her body stripped of clothes, stripped of skin, shredded from a hail of metal and stone sharpnel. From the front, she doesn't look human. She looks like meat. I scream and scramble backward on my hands and feet like a crab, wiping my bloody hands on the ground. They make a red paste with the dust. I roll to my knees, haul myself to my feet, look around for somebody, anybody who can do something. Suddenly, there are lights up ahead in the middle of the road where we're walking. It's a big square white lorry with tall blue letters on the side. UN. The United Nations is supposed to be here to help the suffering to facilitate peace. With a gasp of relief, I run to meet the truck, waving my hand to stop them. Help is here, I shout to the little boy as I pass him. These men will help you. I'm standing in the middle of the road, right in the truck's path. It slows. The driver sees me. He meets my eye. Please have medics, I think. Please have some kind counselor who can take care of this poor child. Please have someone to compassionately tend to that poor girl's body to cover her ravaged face. But the UN truck swerves around me, increasing speed. Okay, I think. They're going to the wounded in the center of the bridge. But the truck doesn't stop. It drives fast enough to make the damaged bridge shake. It swerves carefully around the carnage and rubble and carries on as if dead Bosnians weren't sprawled on the streets. The world is watching and it doesn't care. Thank you. Thank you. We also had a river that witnessed savagery. And the name, its name was Put. And so I tried to capture whatever I I could I could capture at that time. Behold how peaceful runs the put, its banks and hills pristine, no sign left of human blood. Bestiality was with beauty covered, only charm left to be seen. There is no moment, no prayer for washed away blood, for witness left no more for beauty masking barbarity. All puts 
once blood stained cleaned oh i'm sorry and put and puts once blood stained cleaned up shore and i have a short one some of it contains the material we discussed yes i have seen seen it all good bad and in between human rise and fall yes i have seen when expect at least beast in the kind kindness in the beast have seen profanity in the holy holiness in profane saneness in insanity sanity in the insane have seen jealousy hate wrapped in masks of love human wolves in sheepskin dressed preaching murder in god's name have seen beauty in the ugly ugliness in beauty a touch of godliness in thievery thievery in so called godly Yes I've seen seen and felt it all ugliness and beauty human rise and fall Thank you Thank you Sam and thank you Amra It's a it's really a privilege for us to hear hear your words uh both on their own and, and juxtaposed. Uh, the final question that I want to invite you to close out with is, um, we living in 2021 now, uh, both around the world and particularly in America, uh, are surrounded by hate, whether it's anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, centuries of racism in this country, the rise in hate crimes against Asian Americans, climaxing last night in the murder of six women amongst eight at massage parlors in Atlanta. What are your feelings in this moment? How do you react? to what feels like awful, unfathomable behavior and narrative and rhetoric. And what are we supposed to do about it? I know it's not fair of me to put that burden on you to tell us how to act, but in your wisdom and your experience as survivors, not just surviving horrors, but surviving a world after having survived horrors. What are your feelings? What is your reactions? What is your wisdom for us? Who do you want to reach? You are trying to reach me? Is that it? Okay. Um, wherever I speak now, I'm trying to impress the name and the value of love. Not, love but uh, as I uh, explained to them that love is something that the whole world was preaching for thousands of years and nothing happened and so I started talking about kindness and I feel that kindness is the key and includes all the all the emotional medicine that can heal a human being. It's not good to generalize or to oversimplify things, but I've seen it in, in my lifetime work and I have seen it in other people trying to improve whatever they 
could allow themselves. And I think that actually the word love disappeared from my mouth already because I feel it became worthless and abused. So kindness, I feel, is the only, only attitude that can heal people. I would, um, I would add to that, that for me, storytelling, um, what Sam and I are doing this evening and through our work, poetry or, or books um, is a way to evoke collective empathy. I think we've lost empathy for each other. Um, and we're not going to do that through statistics through, and again, I speak as someone who started my career as a professor teaching statistics and probability theory at Columbia. But it is the stories that move people um, to see connections um, and humanize the other, whoever the other is. A um, couple of years ago, when I decided to write my book, it was actually a moment where my younger daughter, who was in third grade at the time um, at the school in New York City, she came home. She's a big science and math girl, also loves art. And she came home and she said, Mom, what will happen to Jana, her older sister, um, and me if you and dad are rounded up as Muslims? Will we be left alone? And that was the moment that jolted me, that I thought being in America was going to keep me safe from ever experiencing what I had experienced in Bosnia. And here I was hearing similar fears and concerns coming from my child, born and raised in the United States. And then I remembered a moment of my arrival to, to the US that I um, talk about um, in the book. And it was in January of 1996, January 17, 1996. I was 16 when genocide started, I, would I was 20 when I was entering the United States. I was um, starved, uh, scared, only had broken English and a couple of dollars in my pocket. And I was terrified of men in uniform because to me, they only meant rape or killing. And when it was my time to be interviewed by the immigration officer, I was shaking, I was sweating. And I thought I was going to pass out. So I held on to the counter of his window. He was very serious. He looked at my paperwork and I was waiting for that sentence of go back to where you came from. And instead this man, nameless man, reached out with his hand, touched my hand and said, ma'am, welcome to the United States of America. I'm sorry for what happened to you. You're safe now. I can cry now when I tell that story um, because it's a moment that revived my belief that there is kindness um, in us and that there is empathy in us. And that moment, in fact, changed my life, made me believe that I could start all over again and I could have a better life here and be accepted and not hated for who I am. So I do believe that that is in us, but sometimes it takes being exposed to a story like Sam's or mine for people to realize who they are and that they have that compassion in them. And I think that's one way in which I try to do my work, not only through the cat I never named, but in the classroom. I do think that on a larger scale, we haven't done a great job in education in the US or elsewhere to diversify educators who teach educators. Um, at Teachers College, I'm one of the few faculty members who talk about these issues. And it's important for us to have more faculty members talk about these issues to educators who end up in the classroom with young people who can engage in these 
topics and tell the stories that will counter that hatred that someone may feel because they heard the bias or they heard um, some stereotype um, in their community. And so I think we need to do more of that. And that's something that I hope I will spend the rest of my life doing. I hope if one day when I'm gone, my children look back and say, our mom did this. She tried to evoke empathy in people. And I hope everyone on this call can join in doing the same. Thank you so much, Amra and Sam. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I think we started off our framing uh, by saying that we're here just to listen to stories and we're ending off feeling that those stories are not merely stories, but they are, they create a moral claim on our lives and on our actions and on our choices. And uh, for that, I'm very grateful. Um, so to close out the evening, I wanted to uh, first say thank you to Harriet Jackson, who really um, energetically and inspirationally pulled this evening together, uh, brought people who she are, she's connected to, Amra and Sam, uh, into this one room to uh, generate this conversation. And I'm just so thankful, Harriet, that you took the initiative and uh, made this happen in connection with the Social Action Committee uh, which is a group from our shul who have been working hard to bring um, the questions and the values that we have as Jews, not just from a place of memory, but to a place of responsibility. That the Shoah, which was over 70 years ago already, does not just remain as an event from 70 years ago, but gives us a continued responsibility. Uh, and that means preventing things like the genocide, uh, the Bosnian genocide. That means preventing hate in our country. That means preventing the genocide of Uyghurs in China. And that's uh, there's a claim on us as Jews and as humans when we, hear, when we hear these stories and engage in these events. So really wanna give gratitude to Harriet and to the Social Action Committee and to Sam and Amra uh, for participating uh, tonight and for sharing with us. Uh, the way we close out our evenings uh, has been through breakout rooms. There's no prompt of what to talk about. There's no responsibility to stay, but uh, it's an opportunity we've all just sat and listened. It's an opportunity to process. It's an opportunity to meet somebody new, maybe someone who you've sat next to in person but never met or somebody who you sit next to on Zoom with your picture right next to them and a chance to say hi and uh, make a new connection. And um, with that, we'll uh, conclude. So stay tuned, press join on a breakout room. And uh, thank you, thank you, thank you to, to Sam and Amra for this really incredibly beautiful and, and moving evening. Thank you very much for helping us get together. Thank you. And uh, I do have a question for Amra. I once made a friend. Is she still there? No. I think she jumped to the other room, but I'm gonna I'm gonna close the. Uh, I pressed close, so hopefully she'll come back in. All right. Okay. I'll give her a second. Sure. Sorry. Uh, let me see if I can bring her back. Not yet. <laughs> but uh, I can send you to her. Well, the rooms are gonna close, but I'll, I'm gonna send you in. What? Uh, here, Sam, I'll send you into the room with her so you can continue the conversation, okay? All right, fine. <laughs> um, sorry about that. I wanted to hear your question. There's no way to communicate once you press close. Thanks everyone who's sticking around for the, the last question. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Welcome, welcome back, everybody. Uh, Sam had had a, a question for Amra, and uh, I wanted to give him a chance to ask her. So sorry for jumping you around to the breakout rooms and back. But uh, <laughs> Sam, go for it. Is she? Yeah, she's here. She's here. 
uh, I wanted to ask you, I once had a very good friend and I think he was Bosnian. I don't know his religion, but we were very good friends. He was the conductor of the Zagreb Symphony. Uh -huh. Very talented man, an excellent conductor. Uh -huh. And his name was pretty well known in Yugoslavia. What was his name? Pavle Deshpal. Pavle Deshpal. I don't remember the name from what, what, what years? Oh, yeah, it goes back a little bit. <laughs> I forgot for a moment. <laughs> we have different years. <laughs> <laughs> that that uh, may be the reason, but my mother was a student in Zagreb, and so she, she might she know. She might have known him, because he was known all over, of course. He was beginning to be known here in the States, too. Um, his, uh, it was in the year of 19... Oh yeah, okay, 1970s. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> it's a good I, thing I cannot ask you about a few hundred years ago. <laughs> I, uh, I will definitely check because my mother or I do have a number of uh, uh, friends, relatives who, who might know him. So I will check, um, I will check. Wonderful man, yeah. It's a small okay, world. Thank you. So. thank you very much. Thank you, Sam.